Well, friends, just like we began last week, um, we start with this. Life is a struggle. And perhaps the reason that every day can feel like a war on our souls is because it actually is. Uh, in this four-week series called Live No Lies, it's, this series is based on the book by Pastor John Mark Comer. Um, we're learning to recognize and resist the three enemies that sabotage our peace. And I know that uh, for uh, going on a number of years now, we're feeling like peace is a really hard thing to find. And um, what is going on with all of that? Well, the first uh, of those uh, enemies that sabotage our peace and is probably the most obvious, and that is the devil, also known as Satan or Lucifer. Now, in our modern age, it's common for people to dismiss the idea of the devil as being just a myth or superstition. And I totally understand if you find yourself in a, uh, to be quite skeptical about this whole conversation. Totally get it. However, just as I did last week, I want to ask you today to come with an open mind to consider uh, that there might be something to this. In fact, I think at the very least, when we look at the world and all of the suffering, all the evil, all that happens out there, I think it makes sense that we would at least consider the possibility that there might be the existence of an evil entity or force at play. So for its part, the Bible is clear. The Bible is really clear about this. The devil is a real entity who has a real desire to wreak havoc in our lives. Jesus referred to the devil as the primary source of evil in the world. And he recognized that humanity's primary war against the devil is a fight to believe truth over lies. So we hear, all, we hear this phrase spiritual warfare, and, and when you think of the devil, you might get all sorts of, of images in your mind. And actually today, I hope that what you'll what you'll come away with is actually it's a whole lot simpler and a whole lot less scary than what you see in a poltergeist movie or um, what's out there in popular culture, that actually it's a lot simpler and less scary than that. This is about the battle to believe truth over lies. And this battle is waged largely right here in our thoughts, our thought life. It's the thought patterns that we wrestle with it's the thoughts that we allow to sit and simmer and, and take root. That's the biggest, most important place where this battle is waged. So today we're going to look at how the devil uses deceptive ideas to prey on the disordered desires of our flesh. But ultimately today, Jesus invites us to know the truth in him and be set free. So question as we dive in here today, who are you becoming? Who are you becoming? We all are being formed every minute of every day. We're all becoming someone. Intentional or unintentional, conscious or subconscious, we're all in the process of becoming. So who are you becoming? Now for Christians, the, the real question here is, how do we become more like Jesus? Jesus. Hopefully, that is who we are becoming more and more like all the time is Jesus. And so, how do we do that? Well, this is where spiritual formation comes in. This is the process by which we are formed in our spirits, our inner selves. The process by which we're formed more into the image and likeness of Christ. Now, that's why here at New Heights, we don't talk about Christian education. We talk about faith formation. Very intentionally, the things that are, are growing ministries, our learning ministries, are not focused on information as much as it is formation, faith formation, spiritual formation. How are we being formed in our spirits into the likeness of Christ? Now, our first reading today is, an, I think, a pretty interesting one. And we find in this scripture, uh, Jesus is in his own process of becoming. In this passage, he goes out into the wilderness as part of his own spiritual formation. He's just been baptized. You might remember the story in Scripture where he's baptized by John the Baptist, and, and we hear God saying, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Jesus goes from that moment out into the wilderness for 40 days and nights, and he fasts and he prays, and this is his time of preparation, preparing for his ministry to launch. So prior to this, Jesus is not a well-known person at all. After this, he becomes famous. So he's in the wilderness in this time of spiritual formation, this time of preparation. And won't, don't you know, the devil would like nothing more 
than to put a stop to Jesus before he can get going. And that's often the way that the devil works in our lives. And we are just on the precipice of an important shift, an important change. When we're just about to make a really important step or we as a church are about to do something big, the devil says, now's the time to put a stop to this. So let's see what happens in Matthew 4. And what I want you to really notice here is as we think about the idea of, of spiritual warfare, notice what, how this event takes place. I want you to notice how Jesus and the devil interact. And I want you to pay attention, is this with swords flailing about, or is this something much different than that? So, chapter 4 in Matthew. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. So pause there for a moment. So Jesus has chosen to undertake the, the spiritual disciplines of time away, Fasting, prayer, as a way of preparing himself for the work that is to come, for his mission that he's to carry out. So he is engaging in spiritual disciplines in preparation to carry out the mission that God has for him. And in the midst of that, 40 days without food is a really long time, but possible. The devil comes to speak. And so in, chap in verse 3, During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God... Tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And we'll pause there. So I've noticed, first of all, the way that the devil engages him is just to try to get a little crack, a little crevice. If you are the son of God, then... Remember, Jesus was baptized right before this, and he heard God say, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So his identity has been claimed and spoken, and now the devil wants to challenge that a little bit. And one of the ways the devil works in our lives is to get us to question who we are. Are you a beloved child of God? Are you forgiven? Have you been set free? Have you been saved? Is God always with you? The devil comes to get us to question those things. With Jesus, he says, if you are, why don't you prove it? Why don't you do it right now? In fact, why don't you make some bread? You could do that. That's an easy thing. And now this is the distraction, the bait and switch. Because Jesus has set out to fast on purpose. Why? As a form of spiritual formation. He's doing something important to grow in his faith, to prepare for his mission. And the devil comes right into that and says, you know, you could make some bread right here. And suddenly, all the good intentions uh, are quickly, uh, the possibility of those eroding away with the thought of, oh, some bread would be really good, right? But Jesus says, no, listen, uh, the reason I'm here is to be in conversation with God. So I don't need food. What I need is the word that comes from the mouth of God. He knows the truth. He speaks the truth to the devil's lie. Well, then let's see what happens next, because the devil's crafty, and look what happens in verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. And Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. So first of all, note in, in this attack, do you see where the, where the devil gets his words? What does he use as his tool here? Scripture. He quotes the Bible. He quotes the Bible to Jesus to get him to follow his route. Just because someone's quoting Scripture doesn't mean they know what they're talking about or that they're speaking on God's behalf, right? We all, we all recognize that. But that's exactly the tool the devil's using here. But then also notice what he's trying to do is he's getting Jesus to question whether he can really trust that God is with him? Can he really trust that God will back him up with the long road that's ahead? So why don't you just prove it right now, Jesus? If you are the son of the God, just jump off quick, and of course, God will save you, so what are you worried about? Come on, man. And Jesus says, you must not put your Lord God to the test. Okay, one last interaction, then in verse 8 it says, next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God 
and serve only him. Then the devil went away, and angels came and took care of Jesus. So notice now the devil wants to provide Jesus with a shortcut. I mean, Jesus came, after all, to overcome sin and death and to claim the whole world uh, for God. And Satan says, listen, we, we could just shortcut this whole thing. You don't need to go through all the trouble. Just, just get on your knees right here, and it's all yours, and we're done. Easy peasy. And how often does the devil come into our lives in that way and say, here's a little shortcut. It's not going to hurt anything. It's not a big deal. I mean, kneeling, so what? Compromise. A little compromise here, a little compromise there, right? So the devil comes and whispers in his ear, but Jesus recognizes the lie. And so much of our conversation today is about recognizing the lies of the devil when they come to us so that that we can call it what it is and refocus our minds and our thoughts on the truth of Christ. That's what Jesus does here. Now, I asked you before I read this passage to, to think about what this looked like, what this interaction looked like. Was this some crazy battle where they're at it, jabbing left and right? This is a conversation. This is a conversation. Neither one or the other is yelling at each other. There's not some crazy craziness going on. They're just having a conversation. One of the things that we need to recognize is that the devil will come at us in ways that just seem like no big deal. And we have those thoughts in our minds and we don't even recognize that that's what's going on. I want you to think about this. And actually, this is a quote from, um, from Pastor John Mark Comer here. He says, think about it. The devil can't make us do anything as followers of Jesus. We have to choose it. To get us to choose evil, our enemy has to fool us into walking down a path other than the one Jesus laid down for us, thinking it will lead us to happiness. His primary way of doing this is through illusion. Right, so often, it's just a little trail of breadcrumbs. One breadcrumb at a time, and next thing we know, we've gone way off the path, and we don't even know how we got there. But let's be real clear. There's, there's none of this business, the devil made me do it. Mm-mm. We choose it. God gave us the gift of free will. We choose. So ultimately, at the end of the day, we want to recognize when the lies come our way, saying, the things that sound so good, this will make you happy, this will make you compete, complete, this will make you fulfilled. We have to learn to recognize when that's a whole lot of hogwash. Now, another way to think about uh, this or about temptation is to see all temptation as the appeal to believe a lie, to believe an illusion about reality. So often, the way that the devil will work in our lives is kind of with a sleight of hand, an illusion to say, hey, you know, this thing over here, this is where it's at. And it's easy for us to buy into that false reality. So often we sin because we believe a lie about what will make us happy. So let's go to another story in Scripture, and I don't have the slides up for this one, but this is from the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. It's the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. And this story from Genesis really brings to life, I think, how the devil can work in our lives. You know the story, Eve, the tree, the serpent, all of that, but let's notice some interesting things here. What I want you to pay attention to is the way the serpent, the way the devil speaks and how he tries to work his way in. So, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, do you all know what God said to Eve? He didn't say that at all. In fact, the devil is using a sleight of hand just to get into the conversation. And so Eve responds in verse 2, The woman said to the serpent, No, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. Actually, God didn't say that. God just said you can't eat from the one in the middle. He didn't say don't touch it or you'll die. He didn't say that, but Eve added that. Who knows why? But we tend to do those things. We make up stories we actually, we tend to take something and then we add our own spin to it. It's interesting, this is what she says, and this is what the serpent says back. Well, you will not certainly die, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the serpent 
takes what's been said, and he finds a way to twist, and he says, you won't die. That, that's not going to happen. Now, what is the end result? Ultimately, after a long life, Eve will die. That will happen for her. But the serpent uses it as a way to twist things. And basically, what the serpent says is, God's holding out on you. God is totally holding out on you right now. The only reason he told you you can't eat from that is because if you do, well, you'll, you'll become like God. You'll know the difference between good and evil. The key to that lie is, and the key that comes to us so often is, you know, God doesn't really have your best in mind. The best way for you to find life isn't by what, what Scripture tells you. It isn't by what God tells you. The best way for you to find life is to go take it for yourself. Follow your heart. Your heart will show you the way to life. That's core to the lie that we hear so often. And so listen to what Eve's response is. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and it was pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Don't miss this. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. So just a note, you know, all the pictures we see, it's Eve by herself getting fooled. Adam's like right there like just watching the whole thing, okay? He's just like watching it, and then, and then he, he waits for her to try it first, and he's like, oh, she didn't die, okay. <laughs> and then he takes a bite. So let's just notice, he lets her be the guinea pig here. <laughs> but the point is, you know, she's listening to what the devil's saying, and she looks at the situation, she says, you know, he's right. I mean, look at it. it looks harmless. In fact, it looks pretty good. And if it'll give me wisdom, why wouldn't I? And she takes a bite and everything changes. And it turns out the devil was telling her the truth. She did from that moment forward know the difference between good and evil. You see, her innocence was taken in that and a new perspective was given and suddenly they, she could see reality. So an interesting way that the devil works in this conversation to spin the truth just enough to get her to take a bite. And I wonder about all the ways that that happens in our lives. Uh, Pastor Comer based a lot of his work in this book on a 4th century Christian monk named Evagrius Ponticus. He was uh, a well-known uh, church father at the time who taught especially on this idea of spiritual warfare. And he said that our thought patterns are the primary vehicle of demonic attack upon our souls. Think about that for a moment. Our thought patterns, yes. Our thought patterns are the primary vehicle of demonic attack upon our souls. It's all right here. The battle's here. So forget all the scary movies. Forget all the weird stuff. The primary place it happens is right here in our thought patterns our thought life. Where do we allow our minds to ruminate, to rest? What are the thoughts that we entertain and how far do we take those things? He says, uh, uh, Pastor Comer says, that might sound far-fetched to our skeptical Western ears, but think about it. Have you ever had a thought or a feeling or a desire that seemed to have a will to it? It seemed to have a weight or power over you that was beyond your ability to resist? You know what I'm talking about? There's a thought gets in your head and you just can't get rid of it. Maybe it's about some, something you believe about another person that maybe you think they hate you or you've gotten it in your mind that so-and-so uh, uh, can't forgive you for something or maybe you've started to believe something about yourself like, oh, I, I got to quit this job. I, I'm, I'm not good enough. I can't do this work. Or it's about a relationship that you're in. But we get this something and it just, we can't get it out of our heads. It's like it has its own will to it. Could it be that the thoughts that assault our mind's peace aren't just thoughts? Could it be that a spiritual force is behind them? Could it be that there's more about, uh, that this is about more than mental hygiene or positive thinking? Well, as we read the New Testament, as we look at what Jesus had to say in the other New Testament writers, we, we really see a core conviction here, and that is that deception is tied to temptation, and temptation is tied to slavery of sin. And as Jesus says, it's his truth that sets us free. So we have this link, deception, temptation, slavery to sin. Well, in John chapter 8, we hear Jesus' most in-depth teaching on the devil. Jesus didn't, didn't do a lot of teaching about the devil. 
But in John chapter 8 is a really interesting slice of it, and he gets real clear. And so um, this is a conversation. First, he's talking to some of his followers, but there's Pharisees in the crowd, and they pretty soon challenge him, and it gets very interesting. So again, in this passage, he describes spiritual warfare as a fight to believe truth over lies. So let's dive in here. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We've never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be set free? Okay, of course, they don't get the slavery that Jesus is talking about is a slavery to sin. The ways that we are bound in our brokenness and our sinfulness, the ways that we so easily turn our backs on God. So listen to what Jesus says. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. I'm telling you what I saw when I was with my father, but you are following the advice of your father. Our father is Abraham, they declared. No, Jesus replied. For if you were really the children of Abraham, you would follow his example. Instead, you were trying to kill me because I told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham never did such a thing. No, you are imitating your real father. Now, it's about to get interesting. They replied, we aren't illegitimate children. God himself is our true father. And Jesus told them, if God were your father, you would love me because I've come to you from God. I'm not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't even hear me. Now, listen to this. For you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. So when I tell the truth, you just naturally don't believe me. So we hear those core things that Jesus says about who the devil is. Right? He's not saying this is some crazy, scary thing that you need to run for cover. He just lays it out here and says, listen, he was a murderer from the beginning. He's always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. This is such an interesting phrase. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And now you see the whole basis again for this conversation, that this is how evil works in our lives. The lies. And the, the devil is clever about this. And so when things are 95% true and there's just that little sliver in there, we veer off course. And he knows how to present something to us in just such a way that we entertain it and we make room for it. And pretty soon we start to buy into it. Well, another quote here um, from the book. He says, it's our responsibility to curate our thought life. Now think about this for a moment. Your thought life. What are the things that are going through your brain 24-7, right? Most of us would never want the rest of the world to be able to see what's going on in here, right? If we're being honest with ourselves, we don't want anybody to know what's going on in here. Listen to this. As Dallas Willard said in his masterpiece, Renovation of the Heart, as we first turned away from God in our thoughts, so it is in our thoughts that the first movements toward the renovation of the heart occur. Thoughts are the place where we can and must begin to change. A lot of people today completely miss the power of lies on the mind and the need to curate your inputs as an act of apprenticeship to Jesus. To think critically about what we take into our minds and what we read or watch or listen to or consume or let entertain us. In other words, the famous adage, garbage in, garbage out. Now, this is where we get to the real struggle in our culture today. What are, what are the inputs in your life? What are the things that are constantly feeding your mind? What do you devote your energy and thought life to? Right? What is on your radio all the time? What's on your TV all the time? What newscast are you trusting for your view of reality? What are you scrolling through and looking at? And how much of any of that is actually giving you life? 
How much of any of that is drawing you closer to God? How much of any of that is feeding your soul and forming you to be more like Christ? Now, plenty of it is neutral. Plenty of it's neutral, right? I'm not saying that all that stuff is bad stuff. Plenty of it's neutral. But the point is, are we spending time curating our inputs and curating the thoughts in our minds so that we are formed more into the image of Jesus? Are we allowing other inputs to form us into something else? Now, Pastor John Mark Comer would make the case that if we're not being formed more into the image of Jesus, well, guess whose image we're being formed more into the image of? Okay? You're either becoming more like Christ or you're not. This is the challenge for us today. What kind of thought life am I curating on a daily basis? And is that thought life making me more like Christ or less so? Well, another thought here, we jump into our final scripture this morning. And again, this is on this attention to, so what do I do with the thoughts in my head? And what are my inputs? What's going on? And listen to this. Paul says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now pause there for a moment. That's what we want, isn't it? We want God's peace. But how often is that we can't find that peace because either we're we're overwhelmed with worry or we've got anxiety or we're consumed with uh, trying to impress somebody, or we're consumed with the idea that um, we're not good enough for our job or our relationship or whatever it is, we're, we're consumed with things that don't allow us to rest in God's peace. And so listen to how Paul finishes this. He says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Fix your thoughts. He says, think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. You hear that key piece there. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And so I ask you, where do you fix your thoughts? If you're honest with yourself, you pay attention to where your brain's at most of the time. Are you fixing your thoughts on things that are lovely and true and admirable and excellent? And that's not to say that we should ignore the pain or suffering in the world. It's not to say that we should just pretend everything's great all the time. But it's to understand that we have a choice about where our thoughts go. And we have a choice about what what we decide to sit in and ruminate about. Ultimately, here's the idea. What we give our attention to will shape the person we become. If my attention just goes to my favorite show on Netflix and I can't wait to get back to the next episode, usually when that happens, that's a flag for me to go, wait a second, you're kind of enjoying that show a little too much. Like if I can't wait to go watch my next episode, what's that about? And yet, how many of us have thought, or the next time I can get back to my video game, or the next time I can do whatever that thing is, right? And my question is, is that something that gives you life, that draws you closer to God? Because if not, then you have to say, what's going on here? So what do we fix our mind on? What we give our attention to shapes the person we become. What we think about, we become. So a couple last thoughts. This is important, especially in our digital world today. Um, In order to live in reality, that is, to live in truth, to know who God is and who we are as God's children, we must edit our streams, digital or otherwise. We have to filter our mental intakes. Pastor Comer says, just like we watch carefully what we put into our bodies, like few of us pick up random garbage off the sidewalk and pop it into our mouths, we must take great care with what we allow into our minds. And again, this is not to say that everything out there is garbage and terrible and horrible and evil and bad. The point is we need to pay attention. We need to pay attention. 
and not only pay attention to what's coming in, but make choices about the kinds of intakes that change who we are and shape us into Christ. And so he says, we must take deliberate steps to set our minds on the reality of Jesus and his way. This, in this alone, will lead us into the kingdom where we enjoy the deepest kind of life to be had. Jesus comes offering us abundant life. And we decide to do this. Is that abundant life? That's not God's fault. That's my fault. Simple, isn't it, actually? Friends, at the end of the day, this happens through spiritual practice. We have to be intentional. We have to choose inputs that draw us to God, inputs that help us to be more like who Christ wants us to be. That bottom line happens through spiritual practice, spiritual formation. That means prayer. That means talking to God. Out of all your minutes in the day, how many of your minutes are spent intentionally inputting from God? You don't have to answer that out loud. So how can we present ourselves, our mind and our body, before Jesus? How can we do that intentionally, giving the deepest parts of ourselves to him? The goal, my friends, then, is to put those inputs in. Prayer, time in scripture, worshiping together. Maybe it's going off and having some solitude, some time in which to intentionally talk with God. We want to learn to think like Jesus thinks, to be who Jesus is, but that starts with what goes on in our minds. At the end of the day, we want God to rewire our brain. So here's the thing. While Jesus has come to give us abundant life, the devil seeks to wreak havoc in our lives and destroy all that is good and beautiful. His primary means of spreading ruin is lies and deceit. And as followers of Jesus, we are transformed into his image and set free as we learn to curate our thoughts, curate our thought lives, and lay our hearts before God through spiritual discipline. I feel like I came down really heavy here at the end, and I, uh, heavier than I meant to, but I got to tell you, I'm passionate about this. This has, been a struggle, this has been a struggle of mine for a long, long time, and I am, I am a better person today than I was 25 years ago. I am a better person. I'm not a perfect person. I'm not a great person, but I'm a better person because I try to curate the intake. And sometimes I get it right, and sometimes I get it wrong, and sometimes I have a favorite show that I can't wait to watch, and sometimes I have a video game that I don't want to put down. And sometimes I have a stream that I'm just really interested in what's happening there. Okay, I'm, I'm with you. Why I'm passionate about this is this world is full of pain right now, isn't it? And we all sit here and we go, boy, this world stinks. Let me get back to this. That's what we do. And God says, my people, you're my presence in the world. The world needs my love. Go share it. We're the answer. And the devil knows it. And so what is he going to do? Well, he's going to distract us. He's going to get in our brains and let us think all sorts of things that aren't true so that we can't be the difference that the world needs. That's why I'm passionate about it. We're the difference makers. And it starts by curating our thoughts, making space for Jesus to speak into our lives. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, God, when we're honest with you and with ourselves, we just don't spend much time opening our minds to you. And we spend a lot of time allowing our minds to be filled with all sorts of other things. And while so much of it is just neutral, we, we also make space for things that aren't from you. We make space for things that pull us away from you. Forgive us for the ways that we buy into the lies that are fed to us. Forgive us for the ways that we chase down other paths of happiness rather than simply following you. God, we so easily buy into all the ways that this world offers us life when you're just standing right there welcoming us home. So God, help us to curate our thoughts. Help us to be intentional with our inputs, to be aware of what we're making space for in our brains. Help us to think on things that are lovely and beautiful and true. 
Help us to think on things that give us life and draw us closer to you. We pray, God, that you would transform our hearts and our minds, that we would become more of who you want us to be, that we might not only have the abundant life you want for us, but that we might share it with others. Work in us. Help us to believe your truth, that that we might be your presence of love and grace and mercy in this world. And so it is in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. So friends, I want to ask you this week, uh, as you go about your day-to-day business, I want to ask you to pay attention to your thoughts. Just notice your thoughts this week. Notice the things that you entertain. Notice the places you allow your mind to go. And ask yourself, what is that about? And ask yourself, is this from God? Is this drawing me closer to God? Or what's going on right now? So often we, we have tapes that we play that go all the way back to our childhood. Us adults, we know that, don't we? Things we heard from our parents or things that happened to us at school or, or and it's something that we are part of. Something happened and we started believing something about ourselves that isn't true, but we've decided it is. We need to notice those things and pay attention to those things. And we need to grab onto God's truth that we are his beloved ones. We're forgiven. We're saved. We're given eternal life. And we are sent to be God's presence in the world. So this week, pay attention. Pay attention to what goes on up here, even though it's kind of scary sometimes. All right, thank you. Well, my friends, one of the reasons that we come to this table every week is to be reminded of God's reality. I find it kind of sometimes incomprehensible what Jesus did with this meal. And it's such an important thing for us to remember. When Jesus sat down to share this meal, his last meal, with the disciples, who was in the room with him? Each and every one of them would desert him in his time of need. Every single one of them. Judas, who would betray him, was sitting right there. Peter, who would deny him, was sitting right there. And what did Jesus say? This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. So whatever lies you've believed about your worthiness, about God's love for you, about God's ability to welcome you and work through you, whatever lies you've believed, hear the truth right here in this meal as Jesus says, no, this is my body and blood for you. And if I can offer myself to Judas, then certainly I can offer myself for you. Believe that truth today. And so we remember that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He broke it. He offered it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after supper, our Lord took the cup. He blessed it. He offered it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. As we prepare to receive these gifts of grace, let us pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God and they're for you, God's beloved ones. Let's Receive, share, and celebrate this meal together. Would my assistants please come up this morning? As they do with